talk before a short break from Trig Hoy, um, who most of you know probably quite well. Trig is talking about his Geoscience BC supported work on paleogene magnetism in the boundary area of southern British Columbia, geochronology and implications for precious metal mineralization. Trig Hoy received his BSc in geology from UBC, his master's from Carleton University, and his PhD from Queen's University. He spent 28 years with the BC Geological Survey Branch as a research economic geologist, mainly concentrating on mineral deposits and their setting. He has published numerous research papers and geological maps covering the more highly prospective exploration belts in the southern part of the province. He has been an exploration consultant since 2002, concentrating most of his work in British Columbia, as well as the Arctic Islands, on Ontario, Quebec, Mexico, Argentina, and Chile. Over to you, Trig. Uh, thank you very much, Krista. <clears throat> I'm going to be mainly, this is mainly a, a, a project that was a, a regional mapping project, and we're just going to discuss some of the results that have come out of that. My main focus is I'm going to be looking at paleogene magnetism and associated mineralization in the boundary area, the Okan East Okanagan area in southern British Columbia. And you can see the area shown in this slide here. This is the area that we're going to be concentrating on. And the other people that have been very heavily involved are Wayne Jackman, who's a consultant as well, and Richard Friedman and Janet Gabtis from the University of British Columbia. And they have been doing the age dating. So the only two things that I really want to leave you with to just two concepts, I'm only going to be really discussing sort of a small part of the mineralization in the boundary Okanagan area. And the main uh, points I'd like you to, to get at the end of the talk is that there are a lot of high level Paleocene and Eocene intrusions that of course could have related mineralization with them and many of them do. And these are within bathless, large bathless of the same age or older age. They're hard to recognize, but they do have the potential for additional discoveries in that area. And the second point I'd like to leave you with is that we know there's a lot of epithermal mineralization in the Republic District south of the border. And we recognize that this mineralization extends across the border into Canada, and particularly that there is a new horizon that we feel is very important for discovery of additional epithermal deposits. Just to give you a general idea of where we're talking about. On the left here in the west is the Okanagan Lake and Penticton or Clonus, it's somewhere up here, I'm not sure, somewhere in here. And the eastern part of the area, let's say, is the Rossland area. And this is the uh, mapping area that we basically concentrated on. It includes eight, one to 50,000 sheets. Why is it important? Well, it's produced an awful lot of gold in, in the past, plus base metals from, from deposits of a variety of types and a variety of ages. It's produced in the order of 9 million ounces of gold from mainly deposits in the southern area, including those in the Republic District, and more than 80 million ounces of silver plus lead and zinc from some of these northern deposits. So in future slides, when I show a map, it's going to be this area. A very brief geology introduction. A large part of the area is underlain by intrusive rocks that range in age from Jurassic to uh, Paleocene, which is uh, early tertiary, and Eocene. Uh, and these are all shown in these oranges and yellows throughout the area. They have the, we have these older core complexes. This one was mapped in detail by Vic Prado. And this shows in the bottom, it shows what they schematically would look like. The hanging wall, uh, the whole area that we're looking at here would be in the hanging wall or this Granby Fault, an extensional fault. And on the east side, it's the Kettle River Fault, which would be this fault here. So we're looking at this hanging wall section mainly. And within it, you have extensional tectonics, Eocene in age, and they produce these north trending Eocene grabbins, the ones to the south of the Taroda and the Republic. And certainly here we have the Rock Creek Graben. So just looking at the first point then, we're looking for high level, mineralized intrusions within these bathless. And I'm just going to use two examples. One is in the northern part of the area, and this is originally mapped as uh, essentially Jurassic Nelson Plutonic rocks, but detailed mapping or one to 50,000 mapping shows that it is in fact differentiated suites throughout it. And the other example is in the Beaverdale camp itself. So I want to point out that these have potential for mineralization elsewhere within these batholithic rocks. 
just to give you an idea of the stratigraphy, this is, we used to call it the early tertiary or the tertiary, it's now the paleogene, I guess, that's what they tell me. Um, and uh, it's slided into the earlier Paleocene and the Eocene. We are mainly going to be looking at this age intrusive rocks. This is the first part, just intrusion. And they're essentially called the Okanagan batholith and age dating now indicates that it's mainly Eocene in age and some older Paleocene phases. And of course it does include remnants of people of Nelson or Jurassic rocks. So I'm gonna be using two examples. One is the Lightning Peak camp and the other is the Beaverdale camp looking at these high level intrusions. The Lightning Peak area in the northern part of the area uh, is a northwest trending area of an awful lot of vein deposits, uh, gold quartz veins and silver lead zinc veins. And they extend essentially from a, an Eocene granite uh, here in the southeast. This is the Okanagan Bathlith through some Paleozoic rocks. And of importance, they also occur in this newly recognized and dated Cretaceous intrusion, lightning, which we call the Lightning Peak intrusion. And you can see the host rocks at 164 are um, Jurassic in age. So the key is that the mineralization is certainly uh, Cretaceous or younger and may be related to the Paleocene. What it looks like essentially, uh, just two pictures showing the, uh, some of the veins in the northern part of the area. They are largely gold quartz veins. Some of them are high uh, epithermal, high sulfidation veins. And uh, further south, and this is looking towards the north up here, you have more uh, silver lead zinc gold type veins. And this is just one example from one of the past producers. It's actually being fairly actively explored at present. And the second sample then is in the Beaverdale camp itself. And it's mainly an area underlain by Jurassic granitic rock shown in pink here. And the dates on this are 168.4 for the West Kettle Batholith right in here. It intruded into it are a series of Paleocene intrusions. And two of these, the Tuzo Creek one in the south and the Carmi deposit in the north are both associated with uh, uh, porphyry systems that have been extensively explored in the past. The Beaverdale camp itself um, and the main deposit is the Highland Bell occurrence, sits mainly within the Jurassic granite, but alteration in some mineralization extends into the 59.2 million year Beaverdale Pluton, indicating that again, this has to be then Paleocene or younger mineralization in part. So I'm just going to show a couple of slides from these two. The Beaverdale, it's a very high uh, sulfide rich vein system, extremely silver rich. And it was a prime area for collecting beautiful wire silver. This just, just shows some uh, ruby silver here. Uh, it produced about 35 million ounces of silver about the same as the, the uh, Slocan camp, and they're in east-west striking silver rich veins mainly. And this is the 59 million year old Beaverdale granite uh, that does have alteration and some mineralization within it. This is looking north to Beaverdale, essentially up here, and you, this is the Tuzo Creek area, and you can see that the host rock here is in part uh, the intrusion, is a 58 million year old porphyry, a K felspar porphyry, but it is essentially a dikes form at the upper levels of this porphyry system. This is the host, this is the Jurassic granite that that younger Paleocene porphyry is intruded. And this is a zone of, of as I say, uh, intense dike swarms and classical porphyry alteration. So, and really, so the point of these is to show that there are two examples. I could have talked about the Franklin camp. The Franklin camp is a Jurassic high level, or well, not high level, but small plutons within the, the uh, uh, Jurassic also age rocks. But the two I talked about are the Lightning Peak and the Beaverdale. And the second main deposit type, again, uh, mainly uh, Paleogene in age, it's actually Eocene age, is the um, epithermal systems. And the two points I'd like to leave with you is that the mineralized horizon in the Republic District to the south does across the border and comes into Canada, particularly further west where Neil Church's map, but also in this area, which we can see from some of our regional mapping. And probably most important is that the basal part of the Kettle River, a second horizon, also contains epithermal mineralization. And I'll show a couple of examples. 
Again, the stratigraphy, we are talking about the older rocks underneath here, the intrusive related models. Within these grabens, you have a thick accumulation of mainly alkalic volcanics with an underlying succession here called the Kettle River, which are basal conglomerates, tooth sandstone shales. Uh, and it's called the, and this is a stratigraphy, the Kettle River and the Marin in the Rock Creek Gap graben. And it's beveled and is overlain by five million year, much, much younger rocks. In the States in the Republic District, very simplistically, it's the same stratigraphy. They don't look exactly the same, but there are many alkalic volcanics sitting above a basal O'Brien formation. And above it, you have an unconformity, which has the Klondike Mountain formation dated at about 49.5 million years. And it's within this horizon, actually below this horizon, but related to, the, to this unconformity where most of the deposits in the Republic camp in the States are the epithermal deposits. We have now mapped a similar looking succession west of Beaverdale. And as it lies directly on basement with no interfering marin formation, in other words, and it's outside of the Rock Creek Grab and we assumed it was Marimo formation or equivalent to that. And we got an exactly the same date as the Klondike Mountain 49.5. The base of Kettle River, where the new Wad discovery occurs is at in the, at about in the 51.5 million year Kettle River formation. Okay, so two examples of this Kettle River horizon, which is what I want to focus on. This is actually the Greenwood, uh, the Phoenix Pit of Greenwood. Uh, it's mainly an older scar, as you know, it within the Trass of Brooklyn, but within it, as uh, many others have pointed out, including uh, Linda Caron, you have this small epithermal showing in Kettle River, which therefore indicates it's obviously either Kettle River or younger. And it looks like it's overlain up on top here by the Marin Formation, which implies that this is in fact Kettle River age mineralization. In other words, a second lower horizon. And this is the, uh, the data sample that we took from just over here. It gave us a 51.5 million year age. And the second area is the water currents. And this is a relatively new discovery. We discovered it actually while we were doing regional mapping and this one to 50,000 sheets. Uh, and it's a zone of intense clay alteration, illite alteration that extends for about 800 meters with elevated gold. Gold values to about two and a half grams gold. Extends on this cliff and these outcrops here and beneath this rubble here. It's been, um, it's been, it was staked by Wayne Merton and it's been now optioned to uh, Gold Cliff Resource and they're doing active exploration on it now. This is really what the mineralization uh, looks like. This is the uh, wide zone alteration. It's very classical, uh, low sulfidation epithermal system with intensely clay altered rocks in the Kettle River formation, uh, which includes tooths, a lot of amethyst veins within it, intense speciation, Druze quartz, chalcedony, bladed quartz crystals. It's a very classical uh, uh, low sulfidation system. And interestingly enough, it's cut by in large part unaltered dikes, which we believe are related to the Marin formation, which have dates therefore of just under 51.5 million years. And these are unaltered, so that pretty well restricts this to a classical uh, Kettle River host. So this is the final slide. Um, so what I'm really saying is that there are two, in the uh, Paleocene and within the Eocene, there are two main targets uh, that I think there's certainly Jurassic mineralization, which is probably more prevalent than the whole area. But the first are these Paleocene, high level Paleocene intrusions that often intrude the large bathyliths themselves. And therefore they're very hard to recognize uh, but there certainly are many examples of them. It could be in the Coriel, which is also a 51 million year Eocene intrusion, and the Midas porphyry is actually a high level Coriel pluton within the larger Coriel baffle. So there are large exposures of, the, uh, of, of this granitic material to the north. And the second main target that we're just concentrating on today is within the succession of Penticton group rocks. The classical one in the States is within the Marimor, or well, it's in the actually underlying the Marimor formation or the Klondike Mountain formation, where it unconformingly overlies the sand pool. This is the Republic horizon. 
we recognize now that there is a number of occurrences of mineralization within the Kettle River Formation at the base. It's exactly the same sort of a setting, and certainly the new watt occurrence is a tremendous testament to this kind of mineralization and the, and the potential for this mineralization elsewhere throughout the area. The Marin Formation extends northward, or the at least the basal Penticton group extends northward from Greenwood several well, probably 50 kilometers in probably what was a depression that was a result of the Republic Robin further south. Tremendous exploration potential. Anyway, uh, again, I, I'm not going to go through this, but certainly any type of a regional mapping project involves working with a lot of other people. And I, I certainly do appreciate that and mapping by other people and the GSC and the survey. Um, and I just really urge you all to come out to the uh, Penticton Okanagan area and actually look for rocks and explore rather than play golf, you know. So thank you, that's it.